Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Diogo Rao. Diogo is the Chief Information and Digital Officer of Eli Lilly, a nearly $30 billion revenue pharmaceutical company headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. In his role, he leads traditional IT, digital health, advanced analytics, and data science, as well as information security. Diogo came to Eli Lilly from Apple, where he headed engineering for Apple Retail. He's brought a Silicon Valley art of the possible spirit to his current role. I look forward to hearing how he prepared for an executive role in a new industry for him, where he and his team are innovating, what his work suggests about the future of digital health, and a variety of other topics. Diogo, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Thank you for having me, Peter. That's a pleasure. Well, uh, Diogo, uh, you are the Chief Information and Digital Officer of Eli Lilly, and this is a role, a combination title-wise that is it seems to be emerging and growing, and, and that yet it's new enough that its application differs uh, one CIDO to the next. So I wonder if you could take a moment and uh, provide a bit of background in your purview as the CIDO of Eli Lilly. There are four parts to the role, uh, and I'm going to go through them all, but there's one really novel part that I'm going to come back to in just a moment. So, of course, you can't be a CIDO without having information technology. That's, that's obvious. Uh, the second part of it is information security. The third part of it is the digital part, uh, digital health. And then the fourth part is advanced analytics and data science. Now, as you pointed out, it is uh, there are lots of flavors of these roles everywhere. Uh, this one is a very centralized function, so there's only one of these across the whole company. It reports to the CEO and is a member of the executive team, which gives you an idea of how much emphasis Lilly is putting on the role of technology for its future. The really novel part about all of this, though, is that fourth area, the advanced analytics and data science. You know, you've already got a lot of companies that are combining IT and digital, and that makes sense. You've seen companies like Nike and like Merck bring those together. And uh, once you have it that way, you can't imagine doing it any other way because there's there's just so much obvious fit between the two. But the novel thing here with Lilly uh, is throwing in advanced analytics and data science, which I had nothing to do with. My predecessor and uh, the CEO set that up. And it turns out that's just a brilliant strategy because... You want to have uh, the data scientists and the machine learning professionals close to the people that implement technology. I've seen in my life uh, too many opportunities to use machine learning go by uh, just because it takes too long or it's not worth engaging across another team. And here we're able to do so much in machine learning because we have it all together in one place. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that overview. And I would love to understand, you've been enrolled now a little less than a year. Um, what are some of the areas, uh, perhaps uh, you know, represented in some of the interesting aspects of your role uh, that have become some of your strategic priorities here in year one? Well, my very first strategic priority coming from California to Indianapolis <laughs> is to make sure that I survive winter. Um, I <laughs> had Good to luck. recalibrate myself on what cold means. I used to think that cold was 35 degrees. Um, and now I've discovered that there are uh, an entire vocabulary for weather that's uh, below 35 degrees, uh, some of it which would not be appropriate for a podcast. But um, now, uh, and I even caught myself last weekend saying, oh, it's it's 35 degrees. It's actually nice out today. Um, but uh, on the work front, there are three priorities that I'm after, each one of which is, uh, each one of which, if we can crack it, is big enough to change the industry and really change the lives of patients. So the first one um, is using machine learning for drug discovery. Now, there are a lot of companies out there that are using machine learning already and, and a lot of biotech startups and others uh, that are using machine learning. But the thing is, in machine learning, the victor is always the one that has the most data. It's always any, any no matter how good your model is, if somebody else has 10 times as much data as you, they're going to they're going to beat you out. And the surprise here at Lilly is just how much data there is. We've got thousands of scientists collecting data meticulously uh, all the time and just creating it. And so if we need to go label a bunch of data, we can do that. If we want to uh, classify it or do whatever, we can do that. Um, but on top of that, we've been doing this for decades and we never throw anything away. So we have decades and decades of meticulously uh, cataloged data that is well-structured, well-defined. Uh, you know, if we were an energy company, it would be like we are sitting on uh, untapped reserves, like the size of a continent. And so I'm, uh, I am wholly convinced that we are going to have uh, breakthroughs in uh, drug discovery. Uh, I, I really do believe we're going to have, we're going to see molecules that no human would have ever conceived of through machine learning. The second thing uh, that is a big opportunity is clinical trials. 
So I came to Lilly eight and a half months ago. And before that, I had spent zero time in the pharma industry. And probably like a lot of people, I didn't understand why drugs, prescription drugs cost so much. And, and I didn't really understand the economics of the industry. I thought that uh, I knew that manufacturing probably wasn't the biggest cost driver, but I didn't really know what drove the economics. And I, I thought it was research. But as it turns out, it's not researching new drugs that, it, that drives up the cost in, in pharma. It's the clinical trials. That's the reason that it take it costs a billion dollars for a typical pharma company to bring a drug to market. And the reason that it's so expensive in clinical trials is number one, the cost of healthcare has gone up so much and it costs a lot to support a patient. But number two, you need a lot of patients. And number three, you need patients for a very long time. What's really interesting is the use of digital or lack of digital that is in a lot of clinical trials. And if we can bring in more digital and we can bring in, uh, you know, devices and other and other mechanisms, we can perhaps gather a lot more data uh, and we can gather it in a lot faster, which means we could shorten trial times or possibly reduce the number of patients in a trial. Just a concrete example of that. Uh, one of the things that uh, there are a number of drugs out there to help with are, are is, uh, daytime sleepiness. Well, uh, if you are sleepy during the daytime, the, the standard for measuring effectiveness is uh, a thing called the Epworth Sleepiness Score, which is a self-reported patient survey uh, that a patient will score. Um, it was developed in 1991, and that's still the gold standard in 2022, which is kind of crazy. When you've got activity monitors that you can just put on, and you can just wear, you don't need a, per a patient to fill out a survey to tell you if they're falling asleep in the middle of the day. You can actually measure it, and it's probably going to be more accurate than asking somebody whether they fell asleep. So, uh, you know, we've already brought the clinical trial times uh, down from 10 to 11 years, more to like six to seven. But I think we've got another you know, probably couple of years that we could that we could bring it down and hopefully then reach even more patients. The third big opportunity is to build a direct connection to the patient. Um, pharma, interestingly, uh, comes straight out of 1950s textbooks. It's uh, you know, it is a manufacturing model. Uh, with complete with wholesalers and retailers and you know all of these intermediaries before you get to the actual customer, the the patient. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to rebuild that connection. And when we do that, we can address what's probably the biggest challenge in the entire industry the, uh, for the patients, which is adherence. And that's how that's keeping people on their medications. One of the things that also surprised me when I came into this industry is how low adherence is just across the board on even uh, life saving drugs. Uh, we did a study a couple of years ago for uh, a drug that we have for for treating diabetes called Trulicity, and we had uh, we had very high adherence. That very high adherence number was sixty percent. Sixty percent of our patients were on it, and you know anywhere else in any other sort of an industry or application, sixty percent is usually not a good number. Uh, but here, you know, it's it's uh, it's setting a benchmark. Well, what if we could? intervene in some way? What if we could uh, remind people about taking their medication? As I say this, I just actually realized I actually forgot to take something I was supposed to take today. Uh, you know, a little nudge or a little reminder uh, goes a long way. Or if somebody's coming up to refill their prescription, um, you know, that's a good time to make sure that uh, that financial assistance is, or they have any financial assistance that's, that's needed. Um, and so with those kinds of interventions, I'm sure we can make a huge difference in, uh, in adherence. So with that, I think uh, we can get that direct connection to our patients. I think we can really make a big impact on the, the biggest problem for our patients. Really remarkable. Thank you for, for going through each of those details. I, I want to actually return to a point you mentioned uh, closer to the outset, which is this is an industry you didn't even have experience with. Uh, it's one like, like any of us where you perhaps used the, the fruits of, uh, of what, what, what's been built in the industry, but didn't understand the economics, didn't understand how it all came together. Uh, your, your prior role was as the head of engineering at Apple Retail. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that perhaps in a little bit. Um, but I'm curious, you know, this is a, it is a complex industry, as you say. It's one where a lot of your peers around the organizations ha has, have PhDs and disciplines, and therefore there is a natural distance between your background and sort of like the talent that builds a lot of these things. I, I could imagine that potentially being a little bit intimidating. I know it is a lot for, for your peers oftentimes. Um, you know, uh, what you just described surely is part of the uh, answer as to what made this exciting. I'm not sure how much of those, how many of those priorities revealed themselves prior to taking the job, but maybe let me ask the open-ended question. Um, what did attract you to this despite 
a lot that was new and a lot that was foreign and frankly a lot that may have been as i say a little bit uh, you know a little bit intimidating even well the first thing that got me interested in the role was was actually the the, the very first part where this was an unusual role because it brought in, it wasn't just CIDO, it was that it brought in the machine learning part, which is what caught my attention. I said, that's interesting. Uh, I, I want to learn more about that. So that's what got me interested. I said, okay, sure, let's let's have a conversation. And then I uh, met uh, our the head of HR and our CEO first. And, uh, and I was like, wow, these are actually really nice people, the kind of people I could work with. And then I met a few more people and I said, wow, actually, I really like these people. Um, and, uh, and I kept going and I really do like everybody they met. So then it kind of evolved into the people thing. But as I started going through the people thing, I started thinking about the, um, some of the science of it. And it was actually after one of the, the interviews that I had with the head of R and D, let me, I'll, let me paint a picture for you. A typical, uh, a typical interview, uh, you know, you start off with a question like, you know, how are you, you know, what's your background? What gets you excited about all of this? My, my first interview with the head of R&D, he said, okay, so tell me, what are your big ideas for uh, machine learning and small molecule drug discovery? And uh, so I, that, was, that was how we started. No, uh, no hello, no, uh, what we'll get you excited. Um, and uh, and we, had a, we had a great discussion that day. We, we batted around a few ideas, but that kept sticking with me the whole time through the whole process and actually was the one element that w- of, those three, of those three parts of the strategy that I did uh, come into the role with. The other two actually came along uh, much later. Now, the next piece of all of this, which everyone warned me about, uh, is you're not going to appreciate this at first, but it's going to grow on you over time, which is the mission, the ability to help patients and to touch lives. And I, I will say that that probably didn't affect me very much in the beginning, but I, it, there's this growing sense and I can feel it more and more, you know, every, every week, every month that goes by, that that becomes a bigger part of the purpose of, of what attracted me here. I, I will say that I am very intimidated by uh, by uh, by the caliber of the ta- of the talent all around me. So in my nights and weekends, I've been um, well. First, I've been kicking myself that I didn't take uh, chemistry in college. Uh, but um, secondly, I've been going through and doing Khan Academy, reading textbooks at night. I mean, just as uh, as as much as I can, and it turns out to be actually quite uh, quite helpful. Um, but I'm I think I'll be uh, homeschooling myself for the next few years. <laughs> I like that. Uh, you know, you you alluded to this a little bit, but I'd love to I'd love to, to to get a little bit further into the details. The pharmaceutical industry is one that's known for taking a lot of time to get things done. Uh, you know, oftentimes, and you you point out some of the reasons behind it. I mean, the complexity of what what needs to be solved uh, oftentimes simply takes time, and it takes money. Yeah. Uh, and I and you you've ta- started to talk about some of the things that you see potentially accelerating drug discovery. Uh, and the role the technology and machine learning and so forth can play. Now that you are further immersed in the organization, um, would love to actually get a little bit further into the details as to how you make that happen. That's great. And you are absolutely right about the uh, the, the timeline and the pace being different. So uh, coming from big tech into pharma, both industries are very focused on innovation. You know, in tech, you're not going to be in business if you don't have a new product in another, you know, in the next two years, right? You're, 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 it just, you're, you're out of business. It's the same thing in pharma. It's just a different time scale. It's if you don't have it in the next decade or maybe two, uh, you're going to be out, out of business. So you've got that pressure there that you have to, that you have to innovate. It's just a question of the time scales. One of the things that really surprised me when I first came in was uh, one of the very first uh, meetings that I had, we were talking about revenues in 2030. In 2030, I, 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 you know, coming from the tech world, I, I thought my colleagues must be using some other kind of pharmaceutical that we don't make uh, to be thinking about that that far ahead. <laughs> the, but that reflects the way that the, the thinking that happens because you prepare everything meticulously uh, and you go through such excruciating detail to make sure everything is absolutely perfect. You plot everything out, you execute it on these very, very long timescales. What's interesting about that is that mentality of getting everything perfect and having a lot of time to do things leads into every other part of the business. So things that don't need to be slow are indeed slow. And so I find myself with just things that should take days, take take weeks, things that should take weeks, take months, things that should take months, take years. So in terms of my own organizational priorities, not the strategic objectives, but how I want to run things, the number one thing is to go faster. And 
Uh, I think my team, uh, my team is probably rolling their eyes if anybody is listening to this because I keep talking about this all the time. I'm pretty sure they're actually rolling their eyes when I'm talking to them too, but it's a little bit hard to tell on video uh, if they're actually rolling their eyes at you. Um, the, uh, the it, it is the biggest opportunity, and the way to do that is to just uh, is to slice things up into much smaller segments. So just run things for six weeks and try it out, get started, see what you learn, and then decide to to run with it um, or to stop it. And so every, pretty much every meeting that I'm in, uh, I, I ask, you know, okay, well, what could we what could we get like started on tomorrow and just try it out for six weeks? What well, how can we break this down into something really, really small? And uh, it it sounds obvious to say things like that, but in in this industry, it's it's somewhat unnatural because everything you want to plan everything out. You want to think you want to think about every possible impact rather than than try. And I really like the mindset of let's get in the car and we'll figure out we'll figure out the directions along the way. Let's not plot the route before we leave. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, you, you noted, of course, that advanced analytics is part of your uh, and data, part of your your remits, and part of what attracted you to this that that unusual for the role uh, set of responsibilities assort, uh, associated with that. You mentioned also that part of that was set up under your predecessor. So no doubt the organization had already made some uh, uh, substantial progress towards harnessing uh, an ocean of data that must be collected by an organization like Eli Lilly. That said, um, I'd be interested in sort of understanding a bit about how you've thought about that. As I say, there's there's just su- such a wide array of data that is collected. Um, sometimes the challenge is to find the signal and the noise and to develop, yeah. and to develop a more comprehensive data strategy that will be suitable for the organization uh, across the long term, so that you understand exactly, you know, where 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 should you be pointing this machine that you're developing uh, in order to draw out the insights that might make a difference. Um, talk about some of the key principles behind sure. the way in which you've organized that, please. Great. On the second part of your question, on the strategy, first we need to get everything into one place. Uh, so we have work, we are working very hard to build uh, our own enterprise data platform, which sounds really hard, and turns out it's even harder uh, than it sounds. Um, but that, that is essential to actually have everything in, in one place. Now, in terms of getting the signal uh, from the noise, the way that we do that is with humans. And that's the part that is the next big piece to crack, because we have so much data all over the place. Uh, but what we haven't fully captured is, uh, is human intuition. And that's, that's the next big thing for us. Um, I find it interesting that... All these research papers that I've read about uh, machine learning and drug discovery, they all focus on really hard problems of trying to figure out what is the perfect molecule. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you predict it and how do you do something with zero human involvement? And the opportunity I really think is to actually capture a lot of that human intuition and build that into our models. And I think uh, the way that we separate the signal to the noise is by actually encoding a lot of that thinking. I was just uh, in a meeting with some chemists yesterday where we were talking about exactly that. I was asking them the process. Hey, what's your process from filtering down from 10, uh, 10 molecules to figure out the two or three that you actually want to synthesize? Because that's the part, figuring out that filter, that's the part that is not captured in any data collection. That's where they had very good explanations for why they wanted to do that. But that was human intuition that was built in there. And once we can start capturing that in the models, that's how we're going to separate the signal from the noise. Really, that's such a great a great insight that you have there. That uh, oftentimes the the general descriptions of data and analytics and the various disciplines associated with those the the role that AI plays, the role that ML plays. Uh, you know, w- one gets so quickly to- towards the technical attributes of this that we forget the human element that's essential as the precursor, yeah. as you point out, in many ways to understanding how best to design this. So, a really interesting points you raise there. Um, you know, you you worked. Speaking of data and analytics and machine learning and and these sorts of tech trends that are of extraordinary importance, where quite frankly, uh, some of the digital native stalwarts like the one you left to join uh, your current company have an unfair advantage in attracting that talent. The the percentage of great uh, AI or ML uh, data an- analysts and so on who come from kind of the elite university, such a high percentage of them go to a relatively small number of companies. Uh, to do what you're doing, 
uh, requires a lot of that same talent. Uh, and you've moved, of course, from the sort of center of tech and innovation for the world in Silicon Valley to, to the center of Indiana in the heartland. Um, talk a bit about how, how your organization harnesses that talent and finds great people, uh, perhaps as a combination of, of employees, as well as the broader ecosystem that you engage in order to breathe life in what you've described. I was surprised when I came in at the at the talent. I remember sitting down with uh, with with my boss or CEO uh, maybe two weeks after I was here, and I, I said, "Hey, uh, you know, I've had a lot of surprises." And he said, "Yeah, I, I, anytime you start a new role, there's always a skeleton in the closet." And I was like, "No, no, there's I'm I'm just blown away by by the caliber of the talent that uh, that we have here. I would have." Uh, you know, as I told him, I would have recruited the entire machine learning team uh, to my, you know, to my former job. Uh, you know, how did how did we do this? What was what was the secret uh, that we we're able to get the the uh, you know all of, all of these uh, superstars? Well, there are a few different there are a few different things going on. So number one, um, all of those all of those super smart folks in Silicon Valley, they're not all in Silicon Valley anymore. So thanks to COVID, a lot of them are in different places and don't want to uh, work and don't want to go back to Silicon Valley. And, and as long as we're willing to accommodate that and uh, and build up our remote work, uh, we can do that. And we've, we've uh, hired some just some fantastic folks in Seattle, for example, uh, that are, are just uh, brilliant uh, user experience thinkers. Uh, on, and all of that, I think, is thanks to the pandemic. Now, the second thing is Indy itself. And so some of the place where where uh, places that I, I've just been amazed by the caliber of the talent that is just in this area. When I was at Apple, we were looking at other locations to expand, and we decided in the U.S. that we were going to expand in Austin. I don't remember Indy ever being on our short list of, of uh, places. And now that I look, now that I'm here, I, I, I'm kind of amazed that we missed it. Uh, there are multiple universities all around. If I just take one, just take Purdue for example, they they are a university of fifty thousand people, two thirds of which are STEM. That's Far more supply than you know than than we need uh, you know from a single school alone. Uh, now of course you've got IU, a bunch of other schools all um, all around, uh, and so there, there's a, a ton of local talent that we actually are able to bring into to our campus. And so I, I'm still very bullish actually on on just on, on hiring from uh, nearby. Um, and then the third piece is India. I was also blown away by the caliber of the team that was built in India almost entirely during COVID, um, and so almost. Uh, the, almost all of the, our team members in India have not met anybody from Indianapolis yet, which is kind of amazing to me. And uh, the, the caliber is uh, is just phenomenal. It, it's you know I think there's this misconception that uh, you know you, you want to go to India because it's uh, you know it's a cost arbitrage opportunity. No, you want to go to India because you have uh, uh, you have just volumes of really bright, energetic. Uh, folks there, and uh, we the level of innovation that we see coming out of our out of our team members in India is just is is just phenomenal. And you allude to some of the changes that uh, that COVID, the pandemic, has wrought on organizations, and even some of the silver linings associated with yeah. those. I'm sticking with that point for a moment longer, I and mean, as an executive who transitioned during the pandemic himself, um, I'm curious your own perspectives, any additional thoughts you have about the indelible marks that this period has left on business. And, and, and as you point out, some of them uh, quite good, in fact, uh, in terms of practices, talent and, 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 and access to it. You know, what, what are some other things that come to mind as you think about the, you know, the, the, the likely long tail to the changes that, that, that uh, have been enacted as a result of this grand experiment that's been forced upon all of us over the course of the past couple of years? Well, the first thing is, is that I have to say, I'm really glad we had no time to plan for the pandemic. Seeing how much time, we, seeing how much energy it, it takes to plan for a return to work. I, 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 I think that if we had a year to plan for the pandemic, if we knew that we had uh, 365 days before the first virus was going to hit us, uh, like the entire economy would have come to a grinding halt because we would have all been planning for this. So I think we were blessed with the, the fact that we had no time to prepare uh, unfortunately, on the flip side, on return to work, we've had so much time to think about it that it's caused a lot of stress for uh, for everyone. And there's no company out there that really has nailed it by any account. I would say there are a couple of things that that we learned really well from COVID that I really hope we keep. Uh, the main thing that I really liked about it is that it put everybody on equal footing. One of my pet peeves about video conferencing in the old world was there was always a center of mass. You had the conference room, and then everybody else was orbiting, you know, in the periphery. And, you know, I never felt good being in the periphery. I never wanted to take myself off 
mute when, you know, not knowing, not being able to read what was going on in, in the conference room. But COVID leveled the playing field for all of us because we all get to be the same size box on the screen. And what I'm worried about is uh, if, as we go back and we start going back into the office, uh, we need to make sure that we don't return to that model of the, you know, the, the solar system model uh, where everything orbits around the, you know, the, the central conference room. Um, one practice that Lily is really good about, I have to say, and I can take no credit for this, this happened before I got here as well, is, uh, is the team is, is very accustomed to doing hybrid meetings that they, they started uh, as people started coming back in where everyone is expected to show up with your device in the conference room. So you don't use the main conference room screen, um, you use your screen. And, uh, and that, that kind of a hybrid model, I think is really important to be able to try to keep uh, the, the best parts of keeping everybody on equal footing um, as we come back. Great point. I wonder also, as you look to the future, uh, Diogo, what are some trends that really excite you uh, that you think will have an impact on a business like Eli Lilly? Well, the biggest one is uh, around genetic therapies, uh, gene therapy. I really think that that is, that is going to be the next thing for the next hundred years, let's say. It's not close yet, or it's getting closer, but it's, it, it's not quite there yet. So in my mental model, I think we've got a couple of decades worth of benefit coming from machine learning and drug discovery. And I, I think we're going to tap into that treasure trove of data. And then I think the next wave that's going to come after that is going to be all of the gene therapies. and and. I mean, if we can really crack the code on that and you can start editing at the gene level, we'll be able to fix so many causes of suffering in the world. It's going to be uh, remarkable. The second trend that um, I've had my eye on forever uh, is also quantum computing. And uh, quantum computing is just around the corner, uh, so they say. It was also just around the corner in 2000. uh, And I'm a little worried that it's still going to be just around the corner in 2040. Um, so if it if it does come at some point, it will be an absolute breakthrough for uh, for everything. The question is, is just is it is it real? So I'm always kind of watching that one. I wanted to also ask you, if I may, Diogo, you've had such a, um, a diverse career. You've been a company founder in Silicon Valley. You were a partner at McKinsey. I mentioned uh, a, a little earlier you yeah. and offered you offered anecdotes from your time there uh, that you were an executive at Apple. Now, of course, an executive at Eli Lilly. Um, I, I wonder, you know, as you think about the various realms in which you've had success, um, what are some keys to that success? You know, I, I, I've been perhaps tuned a little bit to, to, in terms of advice you might offer to others who might wish to replicate it in some way in their own way, translating it back to the management of their own careers. Are there any kind of key success factors that you would uh, attribute your rise and, and your success in, in so many different realms uh, that you might articulate? I've certainly had a lot of failures, and there's nothing like uh, failures to teach you things. Uh, the biggest suggestion that I would give my younger self, somebody starting out, is is the value of empathy, and I think that was probably my biggest breakthrough, which was which actually started from a from a training course at McKinsey, no less, uh, but really made me think and really uh, put me me in a different mindset. So I don't ever walk into a meeting without thinking about. Uh, what is on everybody's mind and where, what would I be thinking if I were in their shoes? And, uh, and I do that with, I'm doing a presentation, I'm talking to an audience, I'm trying to think, what are they, what's on their mind? What do they care about? Um, that look, just asking yourself that one question about what's, what, what's on their mind and having that empathy and, and seeing how people come from that is probably the, the biggest thing that I would love to tell my younger self. Some people have that uh, very naturally. Uh, my nine-year-old daughter has more empathy at nine than I think I did at twenty-nine, uh, I, and I would also say it can be learned. So even if you if you feel like you haven't started off as the most empathetic person in the world, like me, uh, you can learn it, and it's an incredible uh, an incredible asset. Well, that's great, great advice, advice indeed, Diogo. Uh, Diogo Rao, thank you so much for a great conversation covering the remarkable things that you and your team are doing at Eli Lilly, a bit about your background and, and, and your history and how you've applied what you've learned previously to your current uh, scenario, uh, what you see in terms of the future uh, w- within the realm of pharmaceuticals and beyond. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Peter. I really enjoyed it.